There's nothing more exciting than the birth of a new baby. So it is with great joy that Paramount Pictures proudly announces the newest addition to the family. Definitely ready for this. Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. As I previously reviewed The Addams Family from 1991, the live action adaptation of the Charles Addams uh, comic, I'm finally going to review their sequel that's even better than the original, surprisingly, and also my favorite of them all Addams Family Values. Yep, which the Adams family themselves had now have a newborn son, Pubert, who's basically like, I guess you could say, a baby Gomez, because Axie uh, <laughs> dresses up like him, even has a mustache like him. <laughs> and also, he's being taken care of by a new nanny named Debbie, who eventually uh, Fester is being incredibly smitten, yet alone shy. Now, what they don't know, however, is that she's actually a serial killer, killing all of her husbands that she married, especially in disguise, just so she can take all the money she wants. And that's what we're going to lead to today. <laughs> Okay. Now, um, after the success of the original film, Paramount was definitely um, expecting a new uh, sequel to show. So we had to wait um, two years from now. And already, since it came out in the month of sequels, well, two months for the holiday season, you know, November and December, because we had uh, Robocop Free. Look who's talking now. Then we have this one, following with uh, Wayne's World 2, Sister Act 2, Back of the Habit, and of course, Beethoven's Second. And out of those movies, well, this, along with Wayne's World 2, and even Beethoven's Second, are the real winners here. Uh, unfortunately, though, unlike uh, the original film, this movie didn't do quite as um, strong as I were hoping they would be because it had a 47 million dollar budget hoping this was going to be as strong as ever but it only made like 48.9 I guess it's because Mrs. Doubtfire was coming out the following week and it was taken over the spot and eventually it made more than this movie did sadly I mean, I guess it was pretty tough for the competition. I mean, seeing how popular Adam's Family was at the time. But nevertheless, I mean, I saw this in theaters at uh, Man Exchange 8 in Glendale, California, which would soon become Exchange 10, and now eventually became a new movie theater. I mean, first it was MGN... Uh, five star cinema and then but then now they change it to simply studio movie grill so to this day uh, the theater had now just been bought back already you know brand new and it's now becoming like all these other theaters where you get to dine in while watching your movie yeah, that sort of thing so it's still around but of course can't go to the movie theaters now because, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Quarantine. Coronavirus. Okay. Well, I don't want to mention that anymore. <laughs> but uh, going back to that, yeah, I remember I went to see it uh, with my family. Uh, my father, my mother, my sister, 
and my brother. And we had a great time, actually. Excellent time. Uh, we, I mean, we were definitely looking forward to seeing this. And yeah, we saw this in THX sound, I remember. And um, I just had fun. I really did. I couldn't believe it. It was definitely the perfect time to watch this in theaters. And I just couldn't stop laughing. I mean, th this movie was so hysterical. I could definitely see why. <laughs> Because it had a lot of macabre humor in there, all of which were written by Paul Rudnick, who happens to be the one who rewrote the script from the original. That's by Caroline Thompson and Larry Wilson. Yeah, so, given an uncredited um, take on that. So, Paramount just, um, once again, released a sequel, joining in with the original director, Barry Sonnefeld, and brought back the original cast, well, all except for um, Judith Melinda, who uh, played Grandmama Adams, this time replaced by Carol Kane. And you know what? This was a significant replacement for her. In fact, she was the right choice. They should have cast her originally because she did an excellent job uh, in the movie The Princess Bride where she plays a very similar witch, I'm thinking to myself, yeah, this is exactly what they should have cast her in the first place when they did the original Adams Family. But I thought Judith Melinda did an excellent job, too. So Either way, I mean, she definitely nails this one. And this time, uh, <laughs> we got other actors to join by, like you got Peter McNicole and Christine... Baranski. I mean, I, I know Peter was from the movie Ghostbusters 2, long before he went on to do Ally McBeal. And Christy uh, went on to do the TV series uh, Sybil. You know, it was Sybil Shepard's uh, sitcom that aired on CBS. Surprisingly enough, I do share the same birthday as her. Yeah, May 2nd. I mean, hard to believe. Yeah. And um, they got David Krumholtz, uh, long before he went on to do, well, the following year, the Santa Claus, who played Bernard, and went on to do um, Ten Things I Hate About You. I remember that. And I know he went on to do the TV series Numbers with Judge Hirsch that was on CBS. Yeah, it was a crime drama series. So, great actor. And... Um, they actually had a new soundtrack, um, once again, by the score done by Mark Shulman. Yeah, so you still have the Adams Family theme. Um, interesting enough, um, well, I'm going to mention that later, but they actually put in the song uh, by Tag Team, because, yeah, this was a very popular song, you know, whoop, there it is, whoop, there it is. Well, they did their version for the Adams Family. It's whoop the Adams family. There it is. Whoop the Adams family. There, yeah, that. And they actually had some more songs um, in the soundtrack. I guess they had to be in part of. And all this other stuff that they went to. <laughs> so, I guess they knew what they were gonna. I guess they knew they wanted to make it more stronger than ever. Also, the term uh, family values. Uh, Rudnick came up with it was something where he actually did a, a speech in 1992 uh, mostly um, talking about the reflections of urban America uh, that's um, that was actually made by uh, presidential candidate uh, by uh, vice presidential candidate Dan Quayle which at the time, you know, there was the riots situation going around. He was blaming them for that, of the breakdown of family values. So that's why they used the term for the title. So, wow. <laughs> and also, it, it's more of like a summer camp movie, too. I mean, yes, I'm, I'm always favored with summer camp films. I mean, Heavyweights being my favorite of them all. Never stop talking about that. 
So I, I love how they went for that approach for this movie, and it really shows. It, it makes the movie even more funnier, too, with all my favorite moments, and I'm going to get to that, too. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, so anyway, um, let's begin. Stars Angelica Houston, Raul Julia, Christopher Lloyd, Christina Ricci, uh, Carol Strucken, Jimmy Workman, uh, Christopher Hart's Han, <laughs> of course, Carol Kane, John Franklin, Joan Cusack, and one of her stunningly performance in her career, Dana Ivory, David Crumholtz, Caitlin and Kristen Hooper, Peter Mitt and Nicole, Christine Baranski, Mercedes McNabb, as you may remember her in the original film as the Girl Scout. Apparently, yes, her name is Amanda Buckman. Cynthia Nixon, um, Charles uh, Bush, Douglas Brian Martin, and Steve M. M. Martin, Allegro Kent, and Maureen Sue Levin and Darlene Levin. Plus, the movie also has cameo appearances, um, half of which have went on to do sitcoms, such as David Hyde Pierce from the TV series Frasier, who plays, you know, Frasier Cranes, his brother Niles. Um, Tony Shalhoub from the TV series Wings, and then later Monk, and been on several films too. Like, he was in uh, Men in Black. He was also in uh, Galaxy Quest, among others. Um, Peter Graves uh, from the TV series Mission Impossible, that's known for playing Robert Barnes, but he went on to do films like Airplane, uh, as well as um, Men in Black 2, as I could think about. Um, many others that he does in his career. And I know he's no longer with us. Uh, Nathan Lane. Ironically enough, he went on to play uh, Gomez Adams in, in the musical adaptation of The Adams Family. But of course, he's been known for doing um, other films and like Life of Mikey, He Said, She Said, uh, Does the Voice of Timon in The Lion King, as well as the TV series Timon and Pumbaa. Um, and have been in films like um, Mouse Hunt with Lee Evans, uh, Christopher Walken, and all. And also, uh, yep, Stuart Little, along with its sequel with Michael J. Fox. So, yeah, he was also in Mirror Mirror. <laughs> Barry Sonnefeld. Also, we got Sam McMurray, E.M. Albert Crombie, yes, best known for playing Justin Pitt in the TV series Seinfeld, which was uh, Lane Bennis's aide or boss. Yeah. And um, Harriet Sampson Harris. Written by Paul Rudnick, uh, based on the comic strip by Charles Adams, the same name. And it's directed by, once again, Barry Sonnefeld, who later went on to direct Get Shorty, and he also did uh, Men in Black, the first three films, yeah, with Will Smith and Tom Lee Jones. The movie began set in the Adams family household, of course, Gomez, Morticia, joining in with uh, Wednesday, Pugsley, Uncle Fester, Grandmama, Lurch, and Fane, <laughs> of course. Yes, where well, we saw the beginning of Fester um, going up on top of the roof, howling on the moon, joining in with the wolves, and then, you know, we just see them going around <laughs> doing what they usually do. Uh, meanwhile, Gomez and Morticia, you know, they were just, you know, making love and all. You know, Matisha was just knitting. Meanwhile, she begins to tell Gomez that she's about to have her child right now. So the entire family had rushed to the hospital as soon as possible. 
Even Fiend shows up. <laughs> well, of course, Wednesday and Pugsley were in the waiting room, you know, just chatting with uh, a girl who's just, you know, just ready to have her uh, sibling. Which led to that, too, because that's where we see the surgeon, who's played by David Hyde Pierce, and Fiend just came and <laughs> wants up, uh, hoping that was going to be them, but it was actually just the wrong uh, patient. So he actually <laughs> slaps the, yeah, because he got knocked over by um, all the doctors and just slaps uh, <laughs> the child's, uh, yeah, just act like he spanks him. And then next thing you know, the baby had arrived, and that happens to be their son, Pubert. Yeah, which looks exactly like, you know, Baby Gomez in a way. <laughs> okay. So for a couple um, of weeks, you know, Pugsley and Wednesday were just playing around with Pubert, the newborn son. And basically this was a tradition to actually kill their child you know, while they're born, so... So they were just using the gullotine. <laughs> and he actually just, uh, just read when the, the sharp blade was about to hit down, he holds the, the blade. <laughs> the baby was very smart, too. So they vary because um, they didn't want to get attached to him. Gomez and Morticia decided to hire a nanny. Uh, which is very funny too because they were doing interviews and <laughs> I, I like the part where they actually show that one uh, nanny um, was just using the puppet and then next thing you know Wednesday was using a double puppet <laughs> like, like a ventriloquist I thought that was pretty funny <laughs> okay so now they finally hired uh, Debbie who was played by Joan Cusack just take good care of them. I mean, even though they all fail attempt to murder him, of course. As I mentioned already, yes, she's a serial killer who marries all these rich bachelors for their money. She's always in disguise and all. And at that point on, she was actually uh, appeared on a America's Most Wanted type show called America's Most Disgusting Unsolved Crimes, <laughs> which was hosted by Peter Graves. And I thought that was really funny. Um, just when Debbie had to stay over. And yes, there's even a moment where Fane actually got attached to her. <laughs> he loves her and just kisses uh, Fane. <laughs> uh, yeah. But Uncle Fester suddenly becomes very smitten and very shy that at that point on, Debbie was ready to seduce him. <laughs> yeah. Which led to suspicions from Wednesday. Yep, you even got to see her in the, in the camouflage. I wonder how they did that. <laughs> so, to maintain her cover, though, Debbie actually tricks Gomez and Morticia to believing that Wednesday and Plexi decided to go directly to summer camp so that way fans can get settled for. Them. So that way, because Debbie felt pretty guilty about. It. So they're being sent to uh, Chip, uh, Chippewa, which happens to be the same camp that both uh, Gomez and Fester as kids, you know, just go out, you know, just having fun, playing all these pranks, and also getting to fall in love with, you know, both Froa and Fiona, which eventually they got jealous because of it. Anyway, this time the camp is being run and managed by the overzealous uh, counselors, Gary and Becky Granger, both played by Peter McNicole and Christine Berensky. So, which are being singled out and by by their popular and very pompous girl named Amanda Buckman. Yeah, which at this point on, she was the Girl Scout in the first movie. And she's played by Mercedes McNabb. Led to her macabre appearance and behavior. 
Well, that's where we meet a nerdy bookworm, a fellow outcast, and he's also very allergic. He also has a breathing problem too, of course, uh, named uh, Joel, who's played by uh, David Krumholtz, who eventually becomes uh, Wednesday's love interest, and rightly so. Um, so, of course, you know, during summer camp, you know, things were not going so well for Wednesday and Pugsley, because they're not going to attach uh, the rest of the guys and gals, so they have to stay over in, in their, their bunkers, and they're basically telling them to do exactly what they're doing, but of course, they're always feeling, you know, very deep and grim and pretty much depressed, not to mention contagious. <laughs> of course, um, what led to one of my favorite moments in the movie, and I'm going to explain to her right now. Um, boy, this is going to be a lot. <laughs> um, now, yes, uh, they were planning on doing a, a Thanksgiving the pageant, which they're about to um, do a play on. At this rate, uh, the Mayflower Village, uh, joining in with the Indians, such as Pocahontas and all. Um, now, just to think, I mean, I know we see, um, yeah, Wednesday unfortunately got the parts after, you know, they were, well, they had, they couldn't um, get along with the rest of the gals and everything, and even the guys. And also they got into bigger trouble too. I mean they've been sent inside this small room which they had a lot of posters and uh, they were also watching all these movies you know just to uh, basically you know torture themselves I guess in a way. Um, yeah which I thought that was pretty unnecessary to actually uh, have uh, Joel screaming at the the poster of Michael Jackson's uh, "Healed the World," and I think I'm going to talk about that one too. Which that this also led to this involvement with Michael Jackson. It was supposed to be an Adams Family groove song for him that was going to be used uh, for the soundtrack. Um, at first, they thought maybe they couldn't use it because uh, because in 1993, yes, we. We already heard about this, the, that he was accused of, of child abuse. I know that led to that uh, stupid documentary called Leaving Neverland on HBO. Don't bother, man. It's not worth it. Um, well, of course, because that led to that person who started this mess. But in, in reality, it's because of the contractual issues with Paramount, so they weren't so sure if they were going to use it. So instead, they had to pick a Tag Team, because it was such a popular song, a Whoop, There It Is, and they thought this would be a good purpose for that. Yeah, unfortunately, it actually won a Golden Raspberry Award for Worst Original Song, just like what they did with the first movie with MC Hammer. But I thought it was unnecessary to do that. Come on, I love Michael Jackson, and I really miss him. You might as well just uh, do a clip of that and just replace it with the Instinct poster. Yeah, I know Instinct, because that'd be more scarier. <laughs> okay. A anyway, um, now both of now both Gary and Becky, you know, they were trying to cheer themselves up, and. They were actually watching all the movies, which turned out to be, well, at first it was going to be The Little Mermaid, and eventually that, that is The Little Mermaid, but you don't hear the theme song of, like, let's say if you hear the song Part of Your World, the Ariel sing. But apparently you just hear, um, <laughs> you're going to love this, The Sound of Music, so, which was the movie with Julie Andrews, and then there was... Um, the Brady Bunch, the TV series, as we all know, because the show is from Paramount, and then <laughs> Annie, 
1982 film, that is. I like those movies, by the way, and the show, The Brady Bunch, so you just pick the ones I love. I know, that's funny, because that's what led to, uh, you know, Wednesday getting the part of Pocahontas, and somehow she gave them a devilish smile. <laughs> but Gary and Becky just <laughs> just got over that, so he thought, yeah, just to see what she means. <laughs> but it scares the entire uh, crew. <laughs> Uh, that was just so funny. And that's what I'm going to lead to the next one. <laughs> was when, when Wednesday finally got the part, joining in with Pugsy, dressing up as a turkey. Yeah, that's where they started the play, joining with their parents to watch it. And then, next thing you know, Wednesday uh, changed the words. That's from the script. And that's when they started... <laughs> they started a, a riot that's happening... During the play, we're you know, joining by with Joel, you know, dressing up as the Indian, and, and the rest of his crew to burn down the entire village. I see tied up Amanda, captures her, and you know captures everyone, even Gary and Becky, and the rest of the crew. <laughs> you know, just uh, setting them on fire, and the entire camp on fire. So the Adams' siblings just escape into a camp van, so that way they'll be on their way back to the Adams family household. And both Wednesday and Joel share their first kiss. Yeah. Uh, there's even a moment when Wednesday and Joel actually were explaining to each other too, and they were just talking about how Joel's allergic to pretty much everything, in a way. <laughs> okay. Okay, now we're going to get back to what was happening, too. There was a wedding that was going around with Debbie and Fester. Yeah, they got married. They began to become engaged. So they're joining in with the Adams Family crew. Uh, Fester just had a bachelor party. Um, which, <laughs> there was a funny moment, too, uh, with uh, Lurch just bringing in the, the wedding cake. Hoping that there was going to be... A girl inside, but eventually <laughs> Gomez came and found out that was a girl in there before you bake. <laughs> that was pretty funny. And then they they play all these other games and all. So therefore, um, they were getting ready for the wedding, which happened at night. <laughs> they even throw in a, a dead man. <laughs> Inside the, the car, you know, with all the cans, you know, just, you know, putting in the sun, just married on their car. So they, they're about to go off, sail on their honeymoon, which at this point, Debbie was ready to plan some uh, attempts to murder Fester. Uh, first, just when they're about to go on their Hawaiian vacation, stay at the hotel, Fester was taking a bath. And then somehow, Debbie just took out um, <laughs> the boom box, which has a song that she bought at an order from Time Life. You know, all these other songs that they included. And then just dumps uh, the boom box inside the bathtub. And that's where Fester got electrocuted. All these uh, light bulbs were popping out. And that led to him actually <laughs> having one light bulb that's that's in his mouth and it's glowing it was dimming and wow he survived <laughs> and yeah th this actually happened in the first movie too where where Fester did put in a light bulb in his mouth and it lights up like magic <laughs> so you don't need a plug for that anyway so then they just moved to a new place um, Debbie just bought in all of it, her stuff all together in this lovely, beautiful mansion, which then this is going to lead to, yes, another murder attempt by actually uh, setting up a bomb inside the package, you know, all dynamite and all. <laughs> so hoping that this was going to be a surprise for Fester. Yeah, but then Debbie had to go back and just, you know, just hanging around with the, the guys, you know, just having a drink, having a party. Yeah, that's where you see a sailor named George, who's played by Tony Shalhoub. Yeah. 
and that's when well yep it did happen the entire place explodes and eventually <laughs> professor lives um and if that was the case i mean that's what led to what was happening when the Adams' family was going through a lot of problems. They found out that Pubert has somehow changed into a spell, eventually becomes a blue eyed, rosy cheeks, and golden haired baby. So, because it looks to me like Debbie must have put a hex on them. And that's always the case. So they're trying to find a way to actually bring him back. And Gomez suddenly becomes horribly depressed that that's where he. He eventually does a raging rant at the police station, and that's where you meet the police desk sergeant, um, who's played by Nathan Lane. And apparently, you know, he was very shocked about this whole thing, but eventually he's, he's not doing anything to help. And that's where Gomez just goes completely nuts, saying, Has the world gone mad? And all that. <laughs> well, not none of them could help. Gomez just felt like he was dying. Like the whole world is crushing down on him. But then finally, um, when uh, Fame just arrived and definitely spotted um, Fester, because of course Fame was being suspicious to find out what's going on inside Debbie's uh, mansion. Because now we know that Debbie's up to no good. So at this point on, Fane had came by, you know, took over Debbie's uh, number one car, and just ran over her. Well, Fane was about to save Fester, and, and that's what led to a chase, where Debbie just brings in her second car. And they're chasing by before Fester finally arrives, and, and of course, along with Pugsley and Wednesday, you know, all together as a family until Debbie shows up with a shotgun and was ready to tie them up in an electric chair and show them all these slideshows you know of her past present and future <laughs> you know like at the beginning uh, she shows that when she was a little girl she wanted a battle arena Barbie for her birthday because it definitely improves her image right there. This is exactly what she wanted. It turns out that she got a Malibu Barbie. <laughs> but that wasn't what she wanted. So what she did, she burned the entire house down and killed her parents. So then that's what led to all the husbands that she married. You know, like a surgeon and the lawyer and all. You know, just ran over them, you know, killed them. And then that's what led to Fester and was ready to uh, shock him. And now, that's where um, baby Pubert uh, came to the rescue, already normal, yeah, from that hex spell that he was given, and now it just goes around <laughs> stopping them, and yeah, stopping the, uh, the electrical chair that was already set up with all these wires hooked up. So yes, he was, Pubert was just using all these other um, techniques to actually uh, save them and he wants a yeah like such as the <laughs> the um, the ball and chain and all and all this other <laughs> other, other stuff then he actually flew all the way up from the roof uh, window and wants up all the way up to the sky <laughs> and that's where you see Amanda and her parents <laughs> yeah the baby just shows up <laughs> the plane move and then went all the way down and then finally uh, you know takes uh, the wires just when uh, Debbie was just uh, turning on the juice and <laughs> baby just then puber just hooks it up and now it just went straight into Debbie and then Debbie got electrocuted <laughs> turned into sand you know with credit cards and uh, yeah white high heels and all so she's gone so now, months later, at Pubert's first birthday party, the rest of the Adamses' uh, family clan had attended, and that's where we meet uh, 
a new love interest for Fester named Dementia. <laughs> so everything turns out perfect. And also Wednesday got to be together with Joel. And I know that's what led to the end of the movie. Where apparently uh, they went to the graveside and that's where we found Debbie. Now, yeah, which led to a jump scare. A necessary one, but hey. Where Joel was about to give a rose to say farewell and then somehow... Debbie's hand, or I, at this rate it might be Fing doing this, pops up uh, from the grave and just definitely takes in, taking Joe in in with him <laughs> as a prank, in a way. <laughs> I just can't help it. I mean, this was just downright hilarious, no doubt. I was laughing hysterically when I watched this movie. No doubt about it. This is as hysterical as I laugh um, as I laugh with other comedies I've watched uh, over the years, uh, even as a kid. Uh, but this movie, um, I just I just can't get enough of this sequel. It was just so goddamn hilarious. Like, once again, I keep repeating myself. <laughs> um, but the cast alone, I mean, they they truly nailed it exactly like they did in the first movie and they I love all the macabre humor that they went into um, also um, of course for Raw Julia's uh, health problems yeah it was still deteriorating as it falls around but he does look like he was in perfect shape and he looked pretty energetic and healthy with his performance very stunningly but yeah, I was getting to the point where yes, he was ready to, to, like he's not going to be able to live this long because he was diagnosed with cancer. And at that point on, um, yes, a year later, he passed away. And I really miss him so much because he was such a great actor. He was in a lot of great films too. Um, he was in the movie um, Kiss of the Spider Woman. Which I know, um, I know William Hurt won his Oscar for that performance he did. But Raw Julia definitely nails it, and so was um, Sonia Bronga. Um, which I know, ironically enough, they went on to do the film uh, The Wookiee, yeah, with Clint Eastwood and Charlie Sheen. Yeah, I'm talking about that, not the, the 2002 film with Dennis Quaid, which I also love. Um, Anyway, but he was always been a great actor. I mean, he's a Puerto Rican actor, and I'm definitely going to miss him. He definitely was the best uh, Gomez we ever had. Uh, and I can see what uh, Joe Houston was explaining that, I think through the interviews and, and all that, yes, he wasn't eating, you know, he couldn't, uh, he was getting a lot skinnier than ever. So I can see why. Uh, but anyway, um, of course, Angelica Houston was just like the first film. She was just excellent as Patricia. Christopher Lloyd, uh, definitely, no doubts. I mean, he was the best Uncle Fester we ever have. Christina Ricci, uh, incredibly stunning. I mean, she really nails her performance, uh, even though she hit puberty at this point on. And I love the dialogue she was given. Joining in with uh, Jimmy Workman as Pugsley, and he was just just great. Um, Carol Kane, I mean, the definitely once again significant replacement to Judith Molina and Riley So. I mean, I, I love the moments with her and and the way she she acts and looks and and feels. I mean, this this really shows, and, and plus, you know. It's, she was ready to pull a spell on Debbie in that one scene. <laughs> like, I remember that one scene where she was giving Debbie that the skull, hoping this was going to be a spell. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah. Um, but Joan Cusack, on the other hand, I mean, this is definitely the best performance I've ever seen from this actress. I mean, coming from, again, the sister of 
John Cusack. They sure have a lot of talents right there. I mean, she was definitely seductive, sexy, attractive, but deadly. <laughs> no doubt. And I could definitely see why. I mean, now I can know why Fester was so, you know, smitten. <laughs> so much. Uh, Peter McNichol and Christine Berensky really nailed it definitely as the co as the owners and and the counselors of of summer camp called Camp uh, Chippewa. I mean, yeah, they were even as creepier as the Adams families themselves. I mean, they're they're just totally perky, too perky. <laughs> And that's what led to these funny moments, too. And, but they were great, no doubt. They, they were just excellent. I, I love these guys. Um, I love all the moments, and I already mentioned it, too. I mean, all f just downright hilarious. Some nice special effects. Um, everything that was included. They did a great job. Um, some nice cinematography. That's this time done by Donald Peterman. And joined in by two editors, Arthur Schmidt and Jim Miller. So they teamed up. They definitely put a fast pace. And I, I love the moment too, where both Gomez and, and Morticia were dancing the tango. Uh, yeah, you gotta love that moment too. This was just stunningly amazing. I mean, it's so awesome the way they did it too. Like the scene where Gomez was spinning uh, Morticia around, and, and it creates a all that flame popping up and then then there's one scene where she takes out the 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 clams and just plays like a uh, like a attuned to the uh, you know the bull rider yeah cuz uh, Gomez actually took out the the uh, the tablecloth and just used it like a, like a bull uh, like a bull riding uh, tune Oh and yes, and they just made a lot of love, and and then all the <laughs> all these uh, wine bottles just pop up and it sprays everywhere. It's just breathtakingly be beautiful seeing that scene when when they're at that local restaurant. And I know uh, Fuster was just taking out these two uh, breadsticks and and his nose just trying to impress uh, Debbie. <laughs> oh, and uh, just to note, uh, Pubert. Uh, if you hear all these baby giggles, um, all these sound effects that you hear from Hubert, believe it or not, they actually got Cheryl Chase. Yes, the same voice actors who did Angelica C. Pickles in Rugrats, and also did the voice of May in the English dub version from 1993, or at this rate, 1989, of My Neighbor Totoro. And I was like, wow. What are the odds here? Because this was the same year that I got to see my neighbor Totoro in theaters, and I think I saw this in the same theater too, most likely, or possibly Burbank. But I also saw, um, I watched Rugrats too that same year when I got cable. Yeah, and so wow, this is interesting. So that that was really cool. Um, even though, yes, they did got uh, twins to play the same part, you know, just for doubles. So probably just use some of the stunts and all, and everything. I love that. And, uh, just, it was great to see uh, Dana Ivory back as Margaret, so we know that she was married to Cousin It, so we got to see Cousin It. You know, as we all know, Cousin It always wears the hats, uh, the glasses, and you know, the shades, and has uh, tall hair, <laughs> talks like a chipmunk. Well, they have a newborn child of their own, too. <laughs> so that's cool. I love that. Um, of course, um, that led to some explanations, because we learned that, yes, uh, we're not so sure if she actually, uh, at this rate, uh, divorce or broken up with um, her then husband uh, Tolly. I mean, because as we know, in, at the end of the movie, that yeah, they were buried. But we're not so sure if they were buried alive at this point. Well, whatever. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, but all in all, yeah, I mean, this is just a fun, awesome, hilarious, macabre, uh, black comedy sequel that you'll never get tired of, no doubt. Um, but it definitely goes well with the first movie, no doubt. Um, this is the best. So, highly recommend it. So that's Adam's Family Values, and I give the movie, what else, five stars. Or two snaps up. <laughs> I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.